guess I should start recording. Now we can get started. And we're almost on time. <laughs> See, we have fewer people here. I wonder if the rest of the people are working on the last minutes of lab four. Or they're getting started early on the next lab. <laughs> or maybe, yeah, that's, <laughs> that could be better, but that shouldn't, that shouldn't come at the expense of lectures, coming to the lectures, because these are important too. Uh, so I think we received about 26 out of, uh, 26 submissions for lab four out of 42. Wow. It's not a whole lot. <laughs> I'm sorry? So what's the like on time up to today? Well, up to today, right? Oh, Is that true? Up to today. Yeah. So I'd like everyone to submit. Even if you even if you used up all of your late days, please do submit. More late days. Say it again. More late days. <laughs> well, we'll consider uh, your effort. <laughs> Let me put it that way, <laughs> because there's there's part of your grade that's determined based on participation. So it does count if you actually submit all of the labs. Okay. <laughs> so please submit something working, basically. That's, that's important for you to learn, even if it's late. OK? How many of you have submitted here? All of you? Most of you? <laughs> OK, I guess that's why you're here. <laughs> OK. But from now on, I mean, uh, ha uh, please submit all the labs uh, such that we can actually look at them and maybe uh, treat it on a case-by-case -case basis. If you not submit, there is no way we can give you any, any credit, right? And please start early, the next lab. I mentioned that this would be long, even though, even though you had four weeks. Okay, today we'll uh, continue with caching. I, I hope this will be the last lecture on caching. Uh, and then we'll move on to main memory. But before that, a couple of announcements. I think Rachada will have office hours today right after a lecture, is that correct? Okay, so you can go to his office hours to get started on lab five. He'll tell you all about lab five. Homework five is due this Wednesday. And lab five, we pushed the due date to April 6th to give you two extra days. I don't hear yays, but yeah. <laughs> I should be hearing them. <laughs> lab five will be a little bit different. Uh, we'll move on to higher level simulation. So far, you'll be, you'll, you are doing very large simulation. But a good part of computer architecture is about doing higher level simulation as well. Because think about, for example, deciding your branch predictor, branch predictor or caching algorithm or the depth of your pipeline based on very log designs. It'll, be a very, uh, it'll take a very long time to simulate a workload like GCC, for example, even something simple as GCC on a very log, gate level very log. It takes even... Uh, uh, a very long time to synthesize something reasonably large, right, uh, in your designs. And sometimes you, you run into syn synthesis problems in your design. Think about simulating a billion instructions from GCC. And a billion is not enough in today's workloads. Modern workloads execute trillions and trillions of instructions for in, I don't know, seconds, right? So it's impossible to do that kind of simulation at the very log RTL level. Which means that it's impossible to do design space exploration at the RTL level because you'd like to decide things like what should your cache size be for this processor? How many pipeline states should you have? What, should, what kind of branch predictor should you use? What kind of memory scheduling algorithm should you use? To be able to evaluate all of these different design decisions, you really need to, first of all, decide different policies and run a bunch of simulations on, on a set of workloads that you really care about. For example, Intel, uh, uh, when they design general purpose processors, they have thousands of workloads, thousands of traces from a variety of benchmark suites. Uh, well, they're, they're not necessarily benchmarks, a variety of real workloads too. And you'll see some of them when we talk about some of the evaluation later on for memory scheduling algorithms. They look into, for example, desktop workloads, laptop workloads, mobile workloads, server workloads, uh, databases, uh, or search applications. They take traces out of these applications, they simulate them on a microprocessor simulator to figure out what should be the cache size for their next processor. If you wanted to do that in a gate level design, well, good luck. First of all, time is a big issue, right? Second of all, if you actually want to modify something in your design, let's say you want to make the pipeline uh, depth, change the pipeline depth from uh, 10 to 15. And you would like to evaluate the impact of that on performance. Well, first of all, you need to make sure that everything works in a gate-level design. 
if you are doing, using Verilog or RTL, and then do the simulations. Well, ma uh, making sure everything works in a gate level design is tough to begin with, right? You, you've been experiencing that in your labs. Getting a functionally correct design is hard to begin with. The next step is design space exploration on a multitude of these functionally correct designs to figure out what's best. Well, that's tough. That's why people go into higher level simulation and they don't necessarily get a gate level design correct in order to do high level uh, design choices, evaluate high level design choices, but they emulate the latencies or uh, latencies uh, of what would happen if you actually did the gate, the gate level design correctly. And that's the idea of high level simulation. Abstract away uh, the logic and model the latencies in the pipeline, like data dependency latencies or the cache latencies, and model the performance effects, hits and misses, and get a performance estimate out of this higher level model without actually going and building a cache that actually behaves correctly at the gate level. Does that make sense? That's the beauty of higher level simulation. That enables you now to do uh, simulate billions of instructions on modern, uh, for modern workloads on different kind of cache sizes, for example. It still takes a long time. It's not fast by any means. And people have actually devoted their lives to make the simulation much, uh, much faster. And there are many techniques to make that simulation much faster, which we will not go into in this course. But it's much, much, much faster than the RTL level designs that you're trying to get correct. Uh, that you have been trying to get correct in the first four laps. So a good part of computer architecture is not only getting the gate level design correct, but also doing the design space exploration with higher level simulation. And that's why we're having these higher level simulation labs in labs five, six, and seven, uh, so that you get to know this aspect of uh, microprocessor design. In fact, uh, whenever you're doing this kind of uh, design of a new system on a chip, if you will, you usually start with high level simulation, do the design space exploration, figure out what are the parameters, like what should be your pipeline depth, what should be your cache size, what should be your branch prediction algorithm, what should be your insertion and replacement policies in your caches, which we'll talk about today, what kind of associativity do you need in your cache. You simulate a bunch of workloads on this high level simulation that gives you the performance and energy numbers. Uh, and after you fix a design, so you say, after you say that, oh, this, these are all the policies that I want in a process, then you go ahead and implement it in Verilog. And in Verilog, you want to implement at most one or two designs or some parameterizable designs uh, that you can simulate maybe very briefly at Verilog. And then once you have the Verilog, you get the critical path timing after that. You don't want to be implementing many, many designs in Verilog because that's a lot of effort. Okay? So this lab is about basically getting that higher level simulator working and exploring branch prediction and caching algorithms. So you'll be implementing branch prediction and caching in this high level simulation. Uh, and we have the specification out and there is an extra credit assignment also. Uh, you can actually play with new caching, cache replacement and insertion algorithms, uh, hope, which, will, which will hopefully improve performance and would like you to provide a short report on what you explore uh, for the extra, extra credit assignment. The first step is to get the specification working correctly for branch prediction and caching. And the second step is to do the extra credit. It should be fun. It should hopefully be easier than Verilog because you don't need to get it, uh, uh, get, the, get the signals exactly correct. Right. OK? Any questions? OK. And cache uh, lab, lab, seven, lab six will be about the actually adding a memory system on top of this simulator. And lab seven will be about adding cache coherence. Lab seven will be perhaps the longest because that's one of the most complex things. When you say adding on top of it, you mean the same code also? I believe so, right, Rachada? Um, lab, lab six will build upon this code. Yeah. Yes. Build on, build on lab five. Yes. And seven on lab six. Lab seven, I'm not sure if it's on lab six. I think, so. I think it's on lab six also. That's right. but. But we're not going to test the lab, lab six part. Yes. Is lab five built on lab one? N oh, is lab five? I think, I believe you can. You yeah. Yes, that's right. You have a new starter <laughs> code. <laughs> no, we, so th this, is a, this is a clean cutoff, if you will. If you haven't done any of the labs in the past, you can start fresh. <laughs> 
you, you have a second life, if you will. <laughs> okay. Let's move to cache performance. Uh, well, we've talked about caching uh, in the last two lectures. Uh, let's try to analyze. Let's, uh, let's go, into, get, go into it a little bit deeper. Uh, we'll talk about cache parameters versus miss and hit rate a little bit. And there are a bunch of different cache parameters. I'm not going to be able to cover all of them. But hopefully, this should go quickly. Uh, cache size definitely affects cache miss rate, block size, associativity, replacement policy, insertion policy, and placement policy. They all affect cache miss or hit rate. So let's take a look at these first three. Uh, and we've also lo looked at the replacement policy a little bit earlier, right? LRU versus random, for example. You should be able to have a good idea of what the uh, effect of uh, different replacement policies on uh, cache hit or miss rates would be if I, if I ask you a question on the exam, for example. And people have focused on a lot of different insertion policies. For one, one question was, do you actually insert this block into the cache when you fetch it? Well, if you, can, if you can predict that you're not going to reuse that block later on, then don't, right? In fact, programmer can uh, place a hint saying that this, this load is the only instruction that will use this data block, if you will, so don't place it into the cache. Such hints, such hints exist today in existing ISAs. For example, in x86, there is a hint bit that says this uh, load is a non-temporal load. Non-temporal means it doesn't have any temporal locality. And the processor, when it actually fetches a block from that load, can choose to not insert that into the cache. Actually, the processor can choose to do anything it wants, right? the hardware designer. Uh, uh, but that's a hint that's provided from the software to the hardware saying that, well, somebody marked this load as non-temporal. So maybe don't insert it into the cache. So I can th imagine other policies that where, uh, in which the hardware can learn this dynamically. And people have proposed this. And some uh, machines today have actually such counters in the cache saying that, well, perhaps some of these blocks should not be inserted in the cache because there's not good enough temporal locality in this region. We're not going to go into those. If you'd like to learn about those, you should really take 740 and 742. But these parameters, well, that, that could be actually a good design question in the exam. So you might want to think about how could you design something like that. But we'll talk about some of these different parameters first. Well, cache size is a major uh, effector, if you will, on the uh, performance of the cache or hit rate of the cache. Uh, this is basically the total data capacity. When we talk about cache size, we normally talk about the data store capacity, not the tag store capacity. So if you have a 64 megabyte cache, it's really the data store. If you add the tax store to it, it's 64 plus x megabytes, right? Uh, and if, you, if the cache is bigger, it can usually exploit temporal locality better because you can have more blocks in it, assuming you don't change the block size. But bigger is not always better. At some point, your cache performance can saturate. So this is a usual curve, if you will. Uh, well, bigger is not always better. Not only your performance can saturate, but it can go down. Because as you increase the size of the cache, you affect the hit and miss light latency. Smaller is usually faster, and bigger is usually slower uh, in terms of cycle, uh, number of cycles. And access time may degrade the critical path as well. So for example, assuming that the uh, access time remains the same, as you increase the cache size, it's the usual curve you get in terms of the hit rate. The hit rate increases up to a point, and after some points, the hit rate kind of saturates. Why? Because the program working set size starts fitting into the cache. I mean, this is just. Uh, this is an average curve. Uh, if you have a, wh why do you have small hit rate at this region when the cache is small? Because you have too small of a cache. It doesn't exploit temporal locality well. You have too few blocks. Right? And maybe thrashing. Right? There's, uh, uh, all of the blocks are missing in the cache. Useful data is replaced also, basically. If you have too large of a cache, well, assuming that the latency remains the same for the cache, uh, at some point, your working set size fitting, starts fitting. For example, you're working on a 206 megabyte uh, total array. If you will, if that starts fitting into the cache, you'll not get a cache mitts after that, right? But you'll not get cache hits also because you don't need uh, larger than a 256 megabyte cache. Make sense? Okay, that's pretty simple. And sometimes, uh, of course, this is, ju this is just an average curve. There may be programs that exhibit a curve that's flat, right? You get some cache hit rate, but even though you increase the cache size, the performance never, the, the hit rate never increases or decreases. Well, what kind of program would do that? You can get a program with 0% cache hit rate. The curve will be flat at 0. Such programs are usually called streaming programs. 
it, they, they don't tell locality. Maybe maybe they're working on a huge array and they're never referring that array. They're referring to that array again, right? You stream through memory, but you never touch any location you access again. Okay, you can imagine other kinds of curves too. Okay, working set, we've defined this earlier actually when we talked about Bellati's optimal algorithm. This is the set of data, uh, the executing applica application references within a time interval. Okay? Any questions on this? It's pretty simple, right? Okay, block size is another parameter that affects uh, cache hit rate. Basically, block size is the data that's associated with an address tag. And you know that this is not necessarily the units of transfer between hierarchies because we covered sub-blocking last time or sectoring. In a sub-block cache, a block is divided into multiple pieces, each with a valid and potentially a dirty bit. You can transfer sub-blocks. And remember what this was useful for. It could improve write performance. For example, if you're doing streaming writes, you could allocate a sub-block and write to it without ever, ever fetching that block from memory. And then if you're uh, actually Right into the next subblock, you could allocate that and write to it without ever fetching that subblock from memory. That way, you eliminate uh, a lot of write misses, if you will, store misses, write misses. Okay. So this is a common curve that you would get, assuming that your cache size is fixed, data store size is fixed. As you increase the block size, your hit rate increases to a point, and after that, your hit rate starts decreasing. Why? Well, you have if, uh, here you have very small blocks, right? Maybe one byte blocks, if you will. If you have very small blocks, you don't exploit spatial locality very well. Right? One byte block doesn't exploit spatial locality well. Uh, and they also have larger tag overhead, which is not really uh, accounted for here. If you have large blocks, very large blocks over here, now for a fixed cache size, you have a very small number of blocks in the cache. Let's assume that you have a four megabyte cache and your block size is four megabytes. You have one block. <coughs> if you're not touching that four megabyte region, too bad. <laughs> As, uh, because of ba basically, if you have too few number, total number of blocks, you have less potential to exploit temporal locality. You have really good exploitation of that particular spatial locality for that particular block. That's why the hit rate decreases here. So you have a sweet spot somewhere here for a given cache, uh, cache size. And also, if you have two large blocks, that's, there's another downside, right? You can waste cache space and bandwidth and energy if spatial locality is not high. Make sense? This is also pretty simple and intuitive, hopefully. You can basically, you can draw these curves uh, at your sleep, hopefully. Maybe after this lecture, after, your, after you study this lecture. <laughs> Obviously, again, this is not necessarily true for all programs. This is actually, I'm drawing the average curve over here uh, uh, for the average program. You could get different curves for different programs. Okay, well, one issue with, uh, so these are some issues with large blocks. People have tried to still have large blocks because they have good uh, benefit for spatial locality, but they, do, they don't want to get uh, the downsides, uh, of some of the downsides of large blocks. And there are two mechanisms to achieve this. One is the idea of sub-blocking that we've seen earlier. And the other is the idea of critical word first transfer. So if you actually have a very large block or somewhat of a large block, uh, it can take a long time to fill, in, uh, fill that block into the cache. Let's say, uh, well, let's say this is your block. Uh, you have 64 bytes, and you're referencing the last byte in that block. You have a load instruction that referenced the last byte. And the block was requested because of that load instruction. The idea of critical word first is, uh, it says, fill the cache line with the critical word first. What is the critical word? The critical word is the word that is requested by the load that generated that cache miss. Because the load instruction does not usually uh, require the entire block, right? The block size can be 64 bytes. The load instruction may be loading one byte. And that byte might be the 64th byte in the block, not the first byte. Now, if you transfer the entire block byte by byte, for, uh, beginning from the first byte, now you need to wait until all bytes are transferred until this load is serviced. In this case, the critical word is the word that the load needs, that generated the miss needs. And that's the idea over here with critical word first. Most processors today uh, transfer the critical word first uh, in the memory hierarchy to the cache such that the load that generated the miss gets serviced as quickly as possible. And then once that load is serviced, the cache fill 
continues. At some point we'll have better markers, I guess. That's the idea. You have 64 bytes here. Uh, the load misses. And load is really referencing the 63rd byte, if you will, of block A. And instead of transferring, let's assume that the bus width over here is, uh, I don't know, one byte. It's not realistic, but let's make it extreme. If you actually transfer this cache block uh, in order, if you will, zeroth byte, first byte, second byte, third byte, dot, 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 63rd byte, in consecutive cycles from the next level in the hierarchy, let's say, it'll take 64 cycles until you get to the byte that's really needed by uh, this load instruction that generated the cache miss. Instead, if you actually transfer this block, knowing that 63rd byte is a critical word, you transfer that one first, and then the remaining parts of the cache block, then you service this load, and while the processor is doing something else, hopefully these cache, uh, uh, par uh, parts of the cache block, these bytes of the cache block are actually being uh, transferred into the cache. Make sense? So of course this does increase complexity, right? Uh, I didn't put it over there, but uh, this does increase com uh, complexity because you need to have, you need to be able to indicate the critical words to the remaining parts of the memory system. You need to be able to transfer words out of order in your memory system. And what if you have multiple loads requesting the ca same cache line? We will see that later on. Maybe you have load A requesting bytes 0, 1, 2, 3. Well, 0 is not a good example in this case. Maybe it's byte 63. And load B requesting bytes 32, 33, 34, 35. Well, there are many critical words now, right? Or critical bytes, if you will. Somehow, this needs to be communicated down the hierarchy. So you really need to communicate a bit vector down the hierarchy. Okay. So that's one thing to keep in mind. If you do not do this, you can actually, uh, especially if you have large blocks, you can actually wait, wait for a long time unnecessarily until your load gets serviced. Uh, the second is large cache blocks can waste bus bandwidth. And we talked about sub-blocking. If you actually divide a block into sub-blocks and associate separate valid bits for each sub-block, you can get rid of some of the effects, some of the downsides of this. Of course, you should be fetching sub, uh, uh, not the entire cache line, right, to be able to get benefit of this one. Or when you have writes, this is useful as we discussed earlier. OK? No questions? OK. Maybe we should do a sectored cache for the uh, next lab. Did we desi decide to do a sectored cache for the next lab, Archada? Not there. You could do a sectored cache. That could be your extra credit, by the way. And you, should, you should see some benefits for write-intensive programs. And you could do your report showing that actually you get a lot of benefits with a sectored cache on a write-intensive streaming, uh, on a program with streaming writes. OK, associativity is the third major parameter of the cache. Uh, how many, uh, basically this means, uh, we, we've defined it many times, but how many blocks can map to the same index or same set? And I've shown you this curve earlier. Uh, usually, as associativity increases, hit rate increases, but you get diminishing returns from associativity. For going from direct map to two-way has a lot of uh, impact on hit rate. Well, large associativity uh, usually leads to lower miss rate and less variation among programs because it reduces the effect of conflict misses. Right? It reduces the effect of the thrashing problem, but it leads to diminishing returns. It also leads to higher hit latency, as we've discussed. Small associativity has lower cost uh, and lower hit latency. And this is especially important for L1 caches, but it also has low hit rate. One question that uh, could be a good exam question is, do you need the associativity to be a power of 2? Can you have a processor with 17-way associative caches? L1 cache or L2 cache. Yes, yes. I think you could, but the logic for assigning the cache is really much more complicated. You, you think you could? I think you could, yeah. but it's much more complicated logic for determining which sector goes and which associative is meant to it. Yeah. 
So you could, first, uh, first of all, I'm not sure if the logic is that much more complex than a 16-way associative cache. You need ex an extra bit. So remember, associativity, the, the number of sets, the number of indices in the cache needs to be a power of 2, right? Because what you do is you take some index bits and use them to index into the cache. And you need to have every single possibility of these bits represented in the number of sets. So if, you're, if you have n index bits, you'd have to the n sets, right? Whereas associativity, once you index into the cache, associativity says, within a given index, how many blocks can you have? There is no reason why this could not be 3, right? Here I'm drawing you a uh, three-way associative cache with four sets, if this allows me to draw anything. There you go, that's better. We can make them all green now. Two, three, one, two, three, four, better. Okay, so basically we have two index bits, one, two, three, four sets, and each set has three ways, way zero, way one, way two, okay? And, well, you index into the uh, different ways and you get the tag out and you compare it to the tag bits coming out. And you can have three comparators, right? And the results of these comparators along with the valid bits coming from each, you input into a logic and that logic gives you a hit or a miss. It just tells you which way, right? That's it. So you can have, uh, uh, the associativity can be an arbitrary number that's greater than one, or greater than equal to one, okay? In fact, people have designed processes with three-way caches, for example. Okay. This is a way of making your cache uh, size not a power of two. <laughs> okay. Have you seen this classification of misses before? Maybe in 2.13, right? Well, I'll go quickly. <laughs> well, uh, cache misses are often classified into three, compulsory misses, capacity misses, and conflict misses. Compulsory misses are misses that you cannot eliminate with caching at all. Basically, this is the first time you touch to an address or touch to a block, and it always results in a miss. Uh, subsequent references should hit unless the cache block is displaced for some of these other reasons. Uh, uh, the number of misses, uh, the total number of misses dominated with compulsory misses when locality is really poor. For example, if you're streaming through memory, you never touch a block again, then all of your misses are compulsory misses. Right. Okay. Capacity misses, uh, this means that cache is too small to hold everything needed. And these are defined as the misses that would occur in a fully associative cache with optimal replacement of the same capacity. Well, that's kind of a mouthful, but that's how it is, basically. You've, you've done everything you could, if you will, to eliminate all the conflict misses. That means that, you, uh, and you still get a miss, and it's not a compulsory miss, then that means that's a capacity miss, right? Okay? Conflict misses, basically, is a miss that doesn't satisfy either of the above. <laughs> It's neither compulsory nor capacity. Basically, you cannot eliminate it. Well, it's not a compulsory miss, and you cannot eliminate it with a fully associative cache and an optimal replacement. Okay. Because if you could, then it's not a conflict, right? Okay. So how do you reduce each miss type? That's actually a good uh, question. There's also actually one other type of miss, which we will later cover, perhaps. It's really called a coherence miss or communication miss. That's the fourth C, if you will. And the idea over there is you've cached your cache block, but somebody invalidated it. Some other processor actually invalidated it because they were writing to that cache block. And that's a coherence miss, if you will, because somebody happened to write to that block before you reused it. And it doesn't satisfy any of these criteria, really. And it happens only in multiprocessors where you share cache blocks or where you share memory. Okay. We'll talk about how to reduce that later on when we talk about coherence. But how do you reduce each mistype that you've seen so far? Compulsory, any ideas? Yes? You could have some sort of smart caching or some sort of hinting earlier in the program that tells you what you're going to use later. 
That's right, yes. So what you said is not smart caching, it's really prefetching. So caching cannot help you, caching alone. Because by definition, these, defini these are things that you're seeing the first time, but prefetching, what you discussed, can help. And we'll talk about prefetching later on. And existing processors heavily employ prefetching, both software and hardware. Conflict misses, how about these? How do you reduce these? That's right, you can increase basically. Yeah, you can increase the more associativity, or you can try to get other ways uh, to get more associativity without making the cache associative. So we'll take a look at some of these approaches because having more, having uh, everything to be fully associative is tough uh, because of the cost, because of everything we discussed. So people have tried to get the benefits of more associativity without actually paying the cost of more associativity. And we'll talk about some of those techniques. Yeah, we'll take a look at this. Capacity misses, well, I guess I've given you. You, you can utilize the cache space better, right? You can probably keep blocks that will be referenced in the cache. That way you'll have more space for useful blocks in the cache. Or you could actually do software management. Uh, you could divide the working set such that each phase of your workload actually fits in the cache. Instead of referencing the entire array, working on the entire array at a given time, you chop up the array into pieces and you, chop, uh, you work on those pieces at any given time. That way your working set for a given amount of time stays smaller. Right? That's the idea. This is also called blocking. And we'll briefly talk about that. If you could do that, that's always a good thing to do. Because you, you get much better cache utilization that way. Okay, so uh, we'll talk about improving cache performance for a while. Uh, remember this equation, average memory access time? This is basically hit rate at this level times hit latency of the cache plus miss rate of this cache times the miss latency for the remaining uh, levels. You could actually improve cache performance by improving all of these, right? You could reduce cache miss rate, you could reduce cache miss latency and cost, and you could redu reduce hit latency and cost. Well, reducing miss rate is the same thing as improving hit rate because one is one minus the other one, right? So there, that's why these are three, not four. So uh, if you would like to reduce miss rate, remember that uh, reducing miss rate can actually reduce performance if you actually change the miss latency significantly, right? Or miss latency or hit latency significantly. Even if you keep hit latency the same, if you uh, change the miss latency significantly such that it's increased, for example, by uh, requiring more costly to refetch blocks to be evicted from the cache, then you could reduce performance. So we need to be careful in all of these, actually. If you would like to reduce hit latency and cost, this is actually the hardest one to do, perhaps. And I say hit latency and cost because latency and cost are not the same thing necessarily, right? Latency of this access may be very high, but its cost may be low because you, you overlap it with many other accesses, such that it doesn't stall the processor. Right? So keep this in mind. We'll talk about memory level parallelism a lot in this lecture. So his, hit latency is probably the hardest one to uh, reduce in a cache, assuming your cache size is fixed. We could obviously change the cache size and reduce the hit latency, but you're really trading off something else over here. Okay, so we'll take a look at some ways of improving basic cache performance uh, by reducing miss rate and reducing miss latency and cost. I think I'm not going to go over all of these, but we're going to go over uh, them one by one. Uh, I don't. I'm not going to go over these, uh, this slide right now, though. So let's take a look at uh, the first thing. How do we get more associativity without actually adding more waste to the cache, without actually adding all these comparators, uh, and without actually having a larger tag store? Uh, because as you add more waste into the cache, your index bits become smaller and your tag size becomes larger. Okay. So instead of building highly associative caches, we could use some of these different ideas that people have proposed in the past, and some of which are actually used in real processors. Hopefully this should be fun. Maybe you'll come up with some of these ideas on your own. For example, you may have questioned, why are we actually taking just these index bits? Why don't we somehow try to scramble them, right, and randomize them? Well, that's the idea of the hashed index function. Well, let's take a look at victim caches first. Victim caches were developed uh, by this paper, actually. This is a nice paper. I'm not going to require you to read. If you take 740 or 742, you'll have to read it. Uh, but the idea over there was building 
set associative caches are expensive. So let's keep the cache direct mapped, but let's try to reduce conflict misses in some other way, in a cheaper way. And the idea is to add a victim cache, a small fully associative buffer. It doesn't have to be fully associative, but imagine it to be fully associative. And by keeping it small, you can make it fully associative. And uh, whatever gets evicted from this direct map cache is placed into this victim cache. Make sense? And uh, basically, it stores the evicted blocks. And when you access the cache, if you get a miss in the direct map cache, you search the victim cache. If you get a hit over there, now that's good. You've evicted something that you're going to actually, uh, that you shouldn't have evicted, right? Then you swap the uh, evicted block over here, the block that you hit, <coughs> and replace the one that's in the direct map cache. Make sense? So that's the idea. It stores evicted blocks. The upside of this is, if you actually have this ping-ponging that we discussed earlier, basically you're referencing block A and B, and they happen to map to the same set. Now you've eliminated misses, eliminated the access to the next level for those blocks, right? You keep referencing A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B. Now A stays here, B stays here, and you keep swapping them between these two different levels, which are hopefully close to each other, very close to each other, such that you eliminate accesses to the next level, okay? So you can, if you can eliminate some conflict misses with a small victim cache. Does that make sense? So this works because actually there are very few blocks people have found uh, that uh, keep uh, being referenced in this way, in this manner, A, B, A, B, A, B. This is not necessarily true for modern workloads, by the way. So modern workloads may be a little bit different. But uh, people have used these caches in real processors. Uh, so the upside of the idea is, in some cases, it can eliminate the conflict misses. And the hope is that it's much faster to access than this next level cache. So next level cache is, let's say, 16 megabytes. And this has 128 entries. So I can keep, you can tolerate 128 conflict misses, if you will, by having that little victim cache over there. The downside is it adds complexity uh, to the processor, to the memory hierarchy. And it increases miss latency if it's accessed serially with L2. So one question, any time you have these cache levels, the question is, do you access them serially or in parallel? Well, if you access the victim cache serially, be before you actually, so if you don't access the next level cache before you figure out whether you, had, you have a hit or miss in the victim cache, then now you increase the access latency uh, if there's no hit in the victim cache. That's true for any other hierarchy level as well. Okay? <coughs> but this is a small, cute idea that actually tolerates many of the conflict misses and gets you in between a direct map cache and two-way associative cache. Okay. What else? How, can, how else can you uh, reduce conflict misses? Hashing is what I briefly discussed earlier. You can, instead of taking the index directly from some of these bits, you can kind of try to randomize it, right? You could have a hash function over here. Of course, a predictable hash function that the index bits, or maybe it takes more bits from the address and randomize it and maps it to a set. This way, the hope is that your uh, blocks in memory are better distributed across the sets in your cache such that you can better utilize your cache and you can get rid of some of the hot sets, the set thrashing problem. Right. If blocks A, B, C, D, E happen to map to the same set, if you kind of randomize the addresses while going through the hash function, hopefully they'll map to different sets. And you'll have a good load balance of the blocks that you're referencing across the entire indices in your cache that way, you'll hopefully minimize the conflict misses you get. Does that make sense? That's a pretty nice idea. If you ever designed hash tables, in a sense, this is kind of a, a cache is kind of like a hash table, right? You could think of it that way. You actually index into a bucket, and your key is really the index. And within this bucket, you have one, two, three possible entries where your key can be. It's kind of like a key value store, a hash table. By hashing better, by determining where your key maps better, you can get much better efficiency in terms of hashing. You don't need to, uh, you, you don't run into these conflict misses. That's the idea. So the upside is this can reduce conflict misses by distributing the access memory blocks more evenly across the sets. Uh, and I guess uh, this just gives you an example. Like, 
in, in many cases, you get these bad patterns uh, of uh, set thrashing or hot sets. Because your access pattern is such that a lot of the axes actually collide in the same index. And one example of this is, uh, for example, uh, well, a simple one is you have a stride access pattern where the stride value equals the number of sets in your cache. Right? For example, you have, in this case, we have four sets, four indices in the cache. If you keep accessing blocks 0, 4, 8, 12, 16, 20, 24, and then you keep re-referencing these. Well, they all map to the same set, right? Set zero. And you don't reference anything else in your program. You have this huge cache. It's kind of wasted, right? You're using only one fourth of the cache space. By better hashing, the hope is that zero maps here, four maps here, eight maps maybe here, 12 maps maybe here. Now you're much better utilizing your cache and you're getting 0% cache hit rate. Because if you look at this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you have seven blocks in your working set, and your cache actually has 12 total blocks, space for 12 blocks. You can actually get 0% hit rate by distributing those blocks better to the sets. Okay? Okay, the downside of hashing is it's more complex to implement. Because now this, this hash function can lengthen the critical path. Then the key question is how do you actually design this hash, hash function? You could have it. Uh, as an XOR of a bunch of bits over here, which is not bad, because it's XOR is simple to do, right? You can XOR a bunch of bits, as long as you don't have a huge tree of XORs. Uh, it's simple, but maybe your hash function is not as good anymore. Right? The randomization is not very well done. Okay? So one, one of the papers that I recommended earlier looks at a lot of these hash functions to reduce misses, uh, reduce conflicts. Uh, remember, I... Uh, recommended Bob Rao's ISCA 1991 paper, pseudo-randomly interleaved memory. That applies to here also. Uh, basically, it discusses a bunch of different hash functions that can minimize the conflict misses uh, in main memory, in the context of main memory. But there's no reason why this cannot be applied to this hash function over here also. But it turns out a really good randomizing hash function is pretty expensive to implement in hardware. And if you implement something that's easy to implement in hardware, then your distribution of the blocks into the sets is not as good. So it's not clear what this good hash function is. And I believe there's some potential to improve this. Or maybe you guys, after you take this course, you can, you can fix this problem. <laughs> Someone will come up with a better hash function that's implementable as well as provides really good uh, distribution of uh, indices into this, uh, it blocks into the indices. The other idea, uh, which is kind of similar but not exactly the same, or actually it's targeting a different problem, if you will, is pseudo associativity. It's also called poor man's associative cache. How can we actually get uh, some associativity uh, without actually implementing, ha implementing multiple comparators in multiple ways? And the idea is simple. If you look at associativity, this way of associativity, this is a three-way associative cache in space, right? But uh, right now, you're, you're searching the different ways in parallel. But you could think of associative in time also. There's always this time and space duality, which we've seen in array and vector processors, for example. You could think of associativity in time as well. Why don't we consider, instead of having searching three things in parallel, why don't we do this serially? Meaning, why don't we divide the cache into virtual ways, if you will. Now these are the three ways. Think about them as sequential, a single day store. And in the first cycle, if you're accessing a block, check if it's here. It's a deck map cache. Right? You generate an index, check if the block is here. Is it there? Great, that's a hit. Is it not there? Well, check if it's in the next possible way, in the next cycle. Basically generate another index for it, potential index for it, and check if it's there. In a sense, that's a virtual way, right? The block can be present in multiple different ways, 
only in one at any given time. But the lookup of those different ways is serial. You search if it's there. If not, you generate another index for that block, a predictable index. Search if it's there. If not, you generate the next index. Again, another predictable index. Not, you don't search the entire cache. And check if it's there. If it's there, that's great. That's the idea. In this case, we basically divide the cache into three ways. And you always can generate the indices serially. Yes? So if we combine that with the hashing, it's like kind of just like a hashing with a linked list? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Well, I wouldn't call it a linked list in this well, case. It's like a linked list of a fixed size. Basically, you're doing chaining, right? Yeah. You, you covered hash tables with chaining. What's, what's happening here is you're indexing into a bucket. Mm -hmm. If you have a match over there, that's great. If not, you chain and you, you generate another index. And if you have that, have your thing in that bucket, that's great. Otherwise, you do chaining. So with that, do they have like a limit on like how many you can chain? Yes, that's right. Exactly. Otherwise, it'll be <laughs> very long, yeah. right? So uh, basically, I'm kind of giving you over here, given a direct map array with k cache blocks, you kind of implement k divided by n sets. And given address ADDR, you sequentially look up these addresses. Basically, 0 through n minus 1. The top bits are 0 through n minus 1, and the bottom bits always remain the same. Make sense? And if you combine it with hashing, actually, now these are not like this, but it's a hash function of the address. OK? It's actually pretty fun, too. Well, what's, uh, the downside is, of course, the serial lookup, right? In a real associative cache, in a rich man's associative cache, if you will, you get the hit or miss signal in one cycle, hopefully. In a poor man's associative cache, now your hit or miss signal is variable latency, depending on which cycle you hit. And in the worst case, the miss latency, uh, the hit, uh, if, if you miss in the cache, the hit latency is very long, right? Well, the, the access latency is very long in that case. OK? This is fun, too. In this case, it's much more like a hash table, as you said. A lot of the concepts in computer science and engineering are very similar. You can think of the cache as a hash table, <coughs> but a much more efficient one than, than the one we're used to in software normally. So you could actually, uh, going, going building upon that, you could actually have linked lists over here too, right? That's another way of actually reducing the conflicts, but that also increases the access time. You could build hardware hash table, hardware linked lists. Okay, the other idea which is also interesting is skewed associative caches. Basically, uh, this is similar to hashed indices, but uh, a little bit different. Uh, it reduces the conflict misses by using different index functions for each cache way. You don't have to use the same index function, because same index function has a problem also. right? If you have the same bits, then you map into the same index. Maybe you want to randomize even more. And that's the idea of skewed associative caches, which was published in this paper. It's a nice paper. But if you look at a basic two-way associative cache today, you take this index function and you map uh, an address to the same index in both ways, right? A block can basically map to either this place or this place. Well, the idea of a skewed associative cache it looks like this. It doesn't have to uh, exactly look like this, but basically you have some function to index into A0 and some other function to index into A1. And the hope is that these functions are different. As a result, different blocks kind of get di distributed differently in the different ways. And the probability of collision of the blocks is minimized. Basically, all of this is to better distribute the blocks to different locations in different ways. Make sense? It's pretty interesting. In fact, a, a block will be in different sets, if you will, depending on which way you put it into because the index function will be different. So this tries to minimize the collisions as, uh, e even more than the hashing function. Because now you have separate hashing functions for different ways. Yes? Do any processors make this distinction for spaces? That's a good question. Uh, basically, do you actually uh, do this kind of hashing function, or do you actually uh, cache the user space versus kernel space separately? I, I was just thinking about like when you know you were mentioning um, like the frequency stuff and I was thinking, well, you know, one of the fine grains probably the difference between access 
of how to sort of get through the kernel space versus like user space sort of stuff. So I was wondering if there was a distinction based okay. on that also. Because I know these are like hardware yes. level of things, yeah. but inside that, there's also yeah. like same distinction of like the four rooms that you can cache and okay. thing yeah. based on the room level. Uh, I'm just asking. So that's a, that's a great question actually. I, don't, I do not know if they actually take into account uh, the particular thing that you suggested, which could be. So for example, if, if you figure out there's a different caching, uh, different temporal locality between user space and kernel space, which could be possible actually, then you could use that. But I know that there are some processors that distinguish between stack and heap, for example, because stack cache is much better. And uh, by, by using this higher level program constructs, if you know that an a, a, a location is allocated in stack, then you could prioritize it in the cache. I think it's similar to what you're descri yeah, describing. Those types of yes, exactly. So if you actually have that kind of higher level information, that may be even better. This is a more lower level design of the cache if you do not have any kind of information. And in fact, people have proposed uh, using separate caches for the stack itself because it has better locality. Now you get into trade-offs over there because now you're dynamic, you're, uh, you have some on-chip space for caching. Do you dedicate some of that to stack and leave uh, the rest to some, uh, some other things. Maybe if the stack doesn't cache too well, then too bad, you'll lose performance. But yes, yeah, so uh, people have tried to uh, look at uh, those high, that higher level information and kind of provide hints into the memory system such that things that have better locality are prioritized in the memory system. Okay. Okay, so that was the idea of secured associative caches. The benefit is indices are more randomized right now. Memory blocks are better distributed across sets and even across ways. It's less likely that two blocks will have the same index. This reduces conflict misses. As a result, you may be able to reduce associativity and get away with a smaller uh, asso uh, associativity, as this paper actually evaluates. The cost is, again, the additional latency of the hash function. So how do you actually design that hash function? This, this picture shows that you basically combine the tag and index some way, uh, some, uh, somehow. And in this case, you actually use just the index bits that you've decided. But there are many, uh, there is a big uh, design space here. Okay. So let's take a look at software approaches a little bit and then we'll take a break. Uh, people have tried to take advantage of caches by redesigning the software or rethinking some of the compiler algorithms. And there are two major ways of doing this. You can restructure the data access pattern such that it's much more nicer for caches. So that you can exploit the caches better. Or you could restructure the data layout such that you can exploit caches better. Let's take a look at some of these. I'll talk about loop interchange, data structure separation, and merging. And we've already talked about blocking. I'm not, I'm not going to go into detail uh, even more. But basically, uh, how do you restructure data access patterns? You can do it by restructuring the data layouts or the data access patterns. Let me take a uh, look at this one. So we've talked about column major and row major matrices, right? If you have a column major matrix, then uh, the consecutive columns follow each other in memory. So they have good spatial locality, right? The columns of themselves. Whereas consecutive rows are far away from each other, right? Wait a second. Is this true? I guess this is true, right? If you have column major matrix, matrix xi plus one comma j, which is the column, follows xi comma j in memory, that's right. I'll always have to draw this, and I would recommend that you do it also in an exam. Where is this? And of course, use a marker that actually marks. OK, much better. So this is the column major. If you have a column major array, this is a column. And this is all consecutive in memory, OK? This is address A, A plus 1, A plus 2, A plus 3, OK? So if you would like to be able to get good caching behavior, if you uh, good spatial locality, if you, will, if, you would like, if you want to exploit spatial locality, you would like to access this array this way, right? Not this way. Does that make sense? Isn't the row closer together? Yeah, in, the, in that case, uh, the different elements are uh, clo uh, closer together, right? Uh, from different rows. Yeah, it's column major, not row major. Okay. Yeah. 
the, this, this column in, in its entirety is uh, stored consecutive. Oh, no. So different elements in different rows are together okay. for this column. Okay? Yeah, it, uh, yeah. <laughs> it depends on whether you think about row major and column major. Sometimes it's hard to do the switch if you're thinking about row major. So basically, you would like to access this array in a column major order, right? If it's a column major, right? Because this is far away, xi j plus 1 is far away from xi j. Basically, uh, this could be a cache line or multiple consecutive cache lines. But this may be in a different cache line, right? This column may be in a different cache line because it's stored consecutively. Okay? So you don't want to access this this way. So this is basically poor code if this is the case, if, uh, if the matrix is stored in a column major order. Basically, you're iterating over the rows first and then the columns next. And you're summing up, basically, if you're computing the sum of all the elements in array. A better code is this. You go over the row first in the inner loop and add these elements first and then add the columns. Right? This is called loop interchange. Basically, if a compiler realizes that the data layout or the programmer realizes that the data layout of the matrix is column major, then you choose this better code. Or if the programmer has written this code, the compiler can realize that this gets really poor locality, so it does a loop interchange. Make sense? This is a commonly used compiler optimization. The first step is, of course, to realize that uh, uh, the matrix is column major. Or what the compiler could do is the compiler can lay out the data. It can restructure the data layout such that this code performs better. Right? Which means that changing the matrix from column major to row major. Make sense? So in this case, restructuring the data layout or the access patterns are both possible to get better performance out of this code. There are other optimizations that can also increase sit rates. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into that, but loop fusion, you can fuse the loops. For example, if you have two loops, and if you're doing something to an array in this loop, and then uh, referencing some other things, and then later doing uh, some other things to that array, and between the array is, uh, uh, the array goes out of the cache, it may be better to merge these two loops where you're actually doing things to the array. Okay? So you can fuse, the, fuse different loops that operate on the same data structure, such that uh, the operations are done at the same time, if you could do that, of course, right, by preserving data references. Okay. Make sense? Are, are these simple? Okay. Have you guys done this kind of optimization? Where? 213? Okay. <laughs> Some of you, maybe. <laughs> okay. Well, there are downsides to this, of course. Uh, first of all, you may not always be able to do this because sometimes you access the array in a column major way, sometimes you access it in a row major way. Well, what do you do in that case? Tough luck, right? You cannot, uh, you, can, you can change one access pattern, but you cannot fix the other access pattern. Or you can change the data layout, it fixes one thing, but you break something else. So ideally, I think, if you really prefer idealism, then you would like to have kind of two versions of the array, if you will. And when you're accessing in a row major order, you use the row major layout. And if you're accessing in a column major order, you use a column major layout. And this is actually a tough problem. It's not clear how to actually do, achieve something like this. But if you're interested in it, this is, a, this is a really good research problem. And if you have multiple arrays, then it becomes tougher also. How do you actually ensure that different arrays do not uh, conflict in the cache? Because you can do this optimization and you may not get much benefit. Okay. The other thing, blocking, you, you probably covered this in 2.13 as well, right? So I'm not going to go into this, but you can divide loops operating on arrays into computation chunks such that each chunk can hold its data into the cache. So the way I'd like to visualize this is, and many compilers actually can do this as, as long as they can determine the array sizes or matrix sizes, uh, at least approximately. Let's say you have this huge matrix that's much larger than your cache. Uh, instead of, uh, and let's say uh, you're doing some operations, you're multiplying this with some other matrix that's also much larger than your cache. Instead of multiplying the entire 
rows and columns, because when you multiply, you take this row and you take you get the dot product of this row and this row, and then you keep adding to it uh, it's the, the dot product of this row and this row to find the elements of the destination array. Instead of doing this in the entire array, you divide the computation or the array into tiles, if you will, or blocks. Maybe I should use a different color. And maybe smaller blocks even. And basically you do the multiplication of this and this first, right? And then this and this next. And then this and this next. And then this and this next. That way this stays in your cache all the time. That way you get much better locality, right? You don't keep evicting the data. And the artisan basically figuring out the tile sizes for the different matrices such that you get the best locality. Okay. This avoids cache conflicts between different chunks of computation that happen to operate on different data. Okay. Essentially, uh, divide the working set so that each piece fits in the cache. You could do this at the programmer level if you actually know what your cache size is and what, your, what, the structure is, uh, what the size of your data structures are. You could do this at the compiler level too. Uh, now, for, uh, to be able to do this at the compiler level, you really need to know the size of the array, size of your cache. Right? Uh, but there are still self-conflicts in a block also. Maybe this block, uh, maybe this is the computation where you don't see conflicts, but there may be computations where uh, you get conflicts within this block. Uh, and somehow, uh, this may be difficult to eliminate. And this may not be known at the compiler or programming time. If you don't know the size of the arrays, it's very difficult to do these optimizations. So a lot of these optimizations that I mentioned at the compile time require this, which is you need to know the sizes of the arrays at the compile time. It's very difficult to do these optimizations if this is not true and if the access patterns are not really regular. That's why tiling or blocking of matrices has been done in scientific applications they work very well for scientific applications because they have very well-structured access patterns. You can know the access patterns at compile time, and you can know the array size at compile time. It's very difficult to do for irregular applications where neither the access pattern nor the array size is known at compile time. Okay. One other thing. Let's take a look at this one. Um, here I'm showing you an example. I guess this is another hash table access, if you will, or key value store. This is a node over here. Well, this may be a linked list in this case. That's OK. It basically is a linked list node. And this is the key. And I guess you're storing uh, the name of someone and the school they go to. Basically, you could think of it as a database of people. And you're searching. Uh, this, this, this code actually searches for a possible key, uh, input key. And this is what the code does, basically. If node key equals to the input key, then you access these other fields and do something with them. Otherwise, you go to the next node. Assume a linked list in this case. This is a pointer-based traversal. Assume a huge linked list and some unique keys that you input. The question is, uh, you figure out that this code actually has poor cache hit rate. And the, uh, the question is why? Or can you improve it? Just based on what you see over here, can you tell me why this has poor cache hit rate? I'll give you the cache, uh, cache block size 64 bytes, I guess. The, the whole structure is moved together. That's right. So, like, every time you change the, like you're just looking for one thing, it's in a completely different cache line, right? Exactly. Basically, you have pretty much no locality in this search because the entire structure, whenever you touch a key over here, it's a cache miss. Because you put the entire structure together, and that happens to be mapped to the same cache line, okay, cache block. Why? Because the other fields over here, that I kind of should have highlighted over here perhaps, occupy most of the cache line, even though they're rarely accessed. What you're really accessing in this node is the pointer to the next node and the key. Right? You always need this. Well, until you terminate the while, one, I guess. You always need this in this equation, but you do not need the other fields. In fact, more often than not, you don't need the other field because I told you that you have unique keys, right? In one access, you're really matching only one uh, node. But we put all of these together in the same cache line. And this is 256 bytes, 256 bytes, maybe four, maybe four bytes, 
maybe four bytes over here too, depending on how big your pointers are. So a much better way of uh, uh, getting locality over here, or much better way of so restructuring this layout of this node is to separate these fields somehow. You could do something like this, for example. This is one example. Uh, instead of putting the na uh, data into the node itself, you can have a pointer to the data. Right? This way, your node itself is much smaller, and it can pack more nodes into a cache block. Right? And you can increase the locality of the accesses of this node pointer and the key pointer. Make sense? Basically, the idea is separate frequently used fields of a data structure and pack them into a separate data structure. Well, I guess in this case, we're packing, this is, this is the separate data structure that I mentioned, but this is the infrequently used fields that are packed into a separate data structure, and they're connected via pointers. There are other ways of fixing this. This may not be the best way, and I'm sure you can come up with better ways. But the one question is, who should actually do this? Who should do this optimization? Obviously, a programmer can do this optimization, right? But programmers do not even have enough time to fix their bugs. Then the key question is, who, who else could do this? Compiler? Hardware? I'll not, that, I'll not give you the answer, but people have proposed compiler algorithms uh, to do this. Uh, and I can recommend you a paper if you're interested in that. It's an old paper. Uh, it's called Cache Conscious Structure Layout uh, by Trishul Chilimbi. Maybe actually I have a reference to this, but if I don't, And it was in PLDI 1999, Programming Languages Design and Implementation Conference. Basically, this describes a compiler algorithm that does profiling to figure out which fields are more likely to be accessed and packs them into different cache blocks. Well, packs the fields that are going to be more likely to act, be reused into the same, it packs the field closely together in the, in the same cache block such that you maximize it rate. OK? It's fun, right? You can think of how to, uh, how to do this in hardware, but it may become complex in hardware. Because in hardware, uh, what you, uh, assume that you get this in hardware. How do you actually get better caching efficiency out of this? And assume that these are your cache blocks. Well, you may need to actually uh, reduce the size of your cache block in hardware and try to cache only these and not these, right? That's one option. OK. All right, I guess let's. Uh, uh, let's take a break over here. That's a good place to take a break before we move into memory level parallelism. How about we come back at 145? Well, that's wrong, actually. Uh, how about we say 149 based on that? <laughs> All right, let's get started. Let's see if we can finish caching today. So we talked about different approaches to reduce miss rates. Let's take a look at miss latency and cost. This is uh, almost as important, if not more important. I can start to determine which one is more important. But this miss latency and cost, uh, this is affected by many things. There are two key things. One is, where does the miss hit? Because the miss eventually goes down in the hierarchy, and at some point it hits at some place. And this could be local versus remote memory, right? It could be the memory attached to this chip, or you could be going off to some other chip. Or even today, uh, uh, we have multiple memory controllers in the chip. Right. For example, I believe the Intel uh, Nehalems have three memory controllers. Right now, they're not. I think the distance uh, from different cores to different memory controllers is the same. But you could have memory controllers that are of the different distance to different cores. Do you hit in the local memory controller or remote memory controller? Or do you go off to another chip to access memory? If you have a big distributed shared memory machine, you could go off to another chip. Uh, what level of the cache in the hierarchy does the miss hit? Uh, what part of the DRAM does the miss hit in? Is there a row hit or row miss or row conflict? We talked about this earlier. How much queuing delay in the memory controller and the interconnect does this particular miss have? You can think about the entire system, and you have all these different kinds of uh, latencies that can affect a particular cache miss at this level. And th this may be predictable. Right? 
the second thing is, how much does the miss stall the processor? Maybe it has a very long latency, but you really don't care about it because it doesn't stall the processor. And this depends on, is the data immediately needed? Well, if you have a load, and this is really the true load, and you're waiting for that to load a register that you're going to use later, very soon, immediately, then it's immediately needed. But if this data is for a store, if you're trying to bring a cache line because you got a store miss, well, maybe the data is not immediately needed because you're storing to the cache line. If you're not going to reuse the cache line with a load soon, maybe you don't care about the latency as much. This is why store misses are less critical than load misses because load misses are immediately needed. Whereas a cache miss because of a store is really not needed as long as you perform the store, right? And there's no one that needs that data, okay? And the second thing is, is the miss latency overlapped with other latencies? For example, in an out of order processor, you can have multiple cache misses outstanding. You can have a load instruction that generated a cache miss, let's say L3 miss, and you can have a later load instruction that generated an L2 miss. Make sense? And the latency of this may not be as important because this may take a long time to service. And remember, this is the older instruction. You're not going to retire any instruction until this one completes. So if this takes a thousand cycles, and if this takes hundred cycles to service, this latency is kind of hidden by the latency of this load instruction, right? Because you're not going to retire any instruction in the machine until this instruction completes. So that's the idea of memory level parallelism, basically MLP, if you will. You have multiple misses that are outstanding and their latencies are overlapped with each other. And for example, if you eliminate this miss, you may not get a lot of performance. If you do better caching such that this miss is gone, you may not get better performance. Yes? Are you kind of assuming like out of order? Execution? Yes, we're assuming out of order execution in this case. Because otherwise, you cannot generate all of these yeah. misses, right? <laughs> okay? So That's the idea. Yeah. Would, uh, would things in out of order execution like, be waiting if, for the cache to be updated? Like before, we had like a mm -hmm. queue of things that are going to be in the cache. Like That's does right. out of order execution wait for those things? Or does it like install for those things too? That's right, yes. Okay. If, if, you have, if you have a cache miss, you need to wait, right? Okay. But you, you can put this instruction to a reservation station and wait for okay. the data. So when the, when the cache is updated, or when the data comes back, uh, you wake up this instruction in the reservation station, such that uh, now it can wake up its dependent instructions. Okay. So like State of flow. Because like anything else might use that in the cache, uh -huh. do all the other instructions have to wait then for the cache to be like completely updated? Uh, other instructions meaning? Like, if, so that's like updating the cache, but another instruction might use that later. That's right. So we'll actually get to that. Basically, okay. what you're, you're, you're thinking about maybe some other load instruction acts the same cache block, right? What do you do in that case? Yeah. And that's the idea of a non-blocking cache. Okay. So we'll talk about, uh, you, you need a non-blocking cache to support multiple requests pending. Okay. Okay, that's a very good question. Basically, this, uh, this overlapping determines how much a miss actually stores the processor. And this miss may not be important at all, as you can see over here, right? because its latency is overlapped. You may as well take maybe 800 cycles to service this, right? Maybe it's not important. And that's kind of people have called this the idea of slack, if you will. Slack is uh, how much you can delay processing of an instruction without affecting performance. And some instructions have slack because they're not on the critical path of execution, if you will. The critical path of execution goes through this load because it's the longest latency instruction over here, okay? So let me introduce you the term of memory level parallelism. Actually, we briefly discussed this before, but memory level parallelism means generating and servicing multiple memory access in parallel. So if you look at this time diagram, if you will, this, uh, this uh, block, uh, uh, this miss to block A is an isolated miss, whereas this miss to, uh, these two misses to block C and B are kind of parallel misses. They're serviced in parallel. Uh, there are many techniques to improve or generate memory level parallelism. Out of order execution is one. Later, we'll see some other techniques to do this. Basically, uh, you out of order execution can enable the generation of multiple misses in parallel. And 
the memory level parallelism actually varies over time. Some misses are isolated and some misses are parallel. Uh, then the key question is how does this affect cache replacement? So we'll take a look at a particular mechanism. I'm not going to tell you about it, but I'm going to assign you a paper to read about it. So the key question is, if you actually look at these two different cases, uh, block A is more costly than block B or C. Why? Because if you actually cache block A, if you're going to reuse it, if this, think of this as happening in a loop, if you will. And you have only space for two blocks in your cache. Or let's say you have only space for one block in your cache. Uh, which one would you catch? Well, you should really catch block A, right? Because once you catch block A, you eliminate this miss, it's great. If you catch only block B, well, you don't eliminate the processor's stall time by that much. Because the processor is going to stall for block C anyway. Right? If you catch block C, again, the same thing. You don't eliminate the processor's stall time because the processor is going to stall for block B anyway. If you really would like to eliminate the processor stall during this period, you should eliminate both B and C. In that sense, these are less, these are less costly. You really need to eliminate both of them to get the caching benefits by eliminating of A. Uh, but by eliminate, by the, uh, to get the caching benefits that you would get by eliminating only A. Make sense? OK. OK. The, uh, so basically, you have this difference in terms of cost in cache misses. And if this is kind of predictable, then you can always decide to cache block A because it's a lot more costly to refetch. And the problem is the traditional cache replacement policies try to reduce miscount. For example, we talked about Belity's optimal, right? The optimal algorithm says uh, evict the cache block that's going to be reused furthest into the future. Well, it doesn't take into account this. So how do we take that into account? Well, I'm not going to give you the answer, but I'm going to give you a, an example that shows that taking this into account would actually improve performance compared to the optimal. The implicit assumption in past policies is reducing miscount reduces memory-related stall time. And it's true if all misses are isolated. Right. Maybe in an in-order machine, a very strict in-order machine where all misses are isolated, that may be true. Or, well, even, even that it's not true, right? All misses really need to have the same amount of latency, same amount of stall time. The problem is misses with varying cost or memory level parallelism breaks this assumption. And cost, we've seen why, why misses have different costs, right? They could hit in, this, in, in different levels of the hierarchy. Eliminating an isolated miss helps performance more than eliminating the parallel miss. And similarly, eliminating the higher latency miss could help performance more than eliminating a lower latency miss. So the problem is not as easy as isolated versus parallel, because the misses can have different latencies also, right? This, this length is not constant as well. Right? OK. So let me give you an example uh, as to why taking this into account uh, would make a, a big difference and could perform better than the Belody's optimal. And this is actually an example from the paper uh, that I'm going to assign in, in two slides. If you look at this, think about this as a loop. And you have this loop iteration. And during this loop iteration, you access uh, the, the iteration accesses blocks P4, P1, P2, P3, P4 in this order. And then basically P4, P3, P2, P1. And then it accesses P1, P2, P3, P4. And these are serviced in parallel. This chunk is serviced in parallel because they happen to be close to each other in the loop accesses. And then you have these two, three serial misses to blocks S1, S2, S3. And they're serviced serially. They're isolated. Yes? I guess I'm a little confused about by yeah. that, do you mean because it's in the cache that you now have the whole block? Or no, or the, they're to, they're to different, these are different blocks. So let me give you a, a possible code example with out of order, assume out of order execution here. A possible code example, let's say this load is accessing block S1. Think about it as a different cache block. Oh, I should say P1, P4, and then load P3, load P2, load P1. OK? Let's assume that this is your code. And then you have some dependencies. I'm ignoring all of the other instructions. And then you have load P1, load P2, load P3, load P4. And somehow you get cache misses in between. Somehow you access some different blocks, such that these also become cache misses. And then later in the code, what you have is load S1. And then you have dependence. You basically have uh, an add that calculates the address of S2, load S2 
and then you have another ad that calculates the address of S3 and then load S3. So these are dependent on each other. That's why you cannot service this in parallel with this load. Whereas here, assume that these loads are all independent. They can compute their addresses independently. In an out of order processor, when this is a cache miss, it gets out of the way, right? Now you can execute this and it can generate its own cache miss. And you can execute this, this can generate its own cache miss. And you can execute this, it can generate its own cache miss. Make sense? So you have four cache misses that are happening in parallel. We'll see how you can support this in the cache. Assume that the cache can support these four cache misses. It's actually relatively easy to support this in parallel. I'll talk about that. Does that make sense? Okay. And then you have uh, something else happens in the loop that we don't care about. And then you again access these four things in parallel. And then you have ca four cache misses. And then something else happened th in this loop, but uh, the stuff in the, is in the cache. Actually, I don't remember what I assumed over here, but we'll get back to that. You need to modify that. And then you later access S1, S2, S3. And then you go back to the beginning of the loop. Make sense? OK. Uh, we're going to look at two replacement algorithms, one that minimizes miscount, that is optimal, and the second that redu reduces isolated misses. We'll call this MLP, memory level parallelism aware. Basically, try to keep these serial blocks, serial uh, misses in the cache. So assume a fully associated cache containing four blocks only. Well, I guess I'm not going to. Let's remove this then, <laughs> the other accesses. So what will happen in this case? In this case, uh, at the steady state, these accesses will hit in the cache, right? Because you'll have satisfied them over here. These will all be hits. Assume that there is no code that accesses in between, right? OK, we're, we're going to remove that code. It looks, the code looks like this. OK, these accesses will hit in the cache, access to P1, P2, P3, P4. And then you'll get an access to S1 which gets a, which is a cache miss because it's not in the cache. That block is not in the cache. Uh, yeah. Yeah, this is the cache state over here. At, at the end of this, you get P4, P3, P2, P1 in the cache. At the end of this, you still get P4, P3, P2, P1 in the cache. Now you need to replace one of them. And the optimal replacement says you should really replace P1, right? Because that's the one that's going to be referenced furthest into the future, assuming that you know this somehow. So this, you get a miss over here, OK? And you calculate the address of the next load dependent on this miss. That's why these two cannot be service, uh, serviced in parallel. You replace this one. Now the optimal replacement says uh, you get a miss over here again. And once you service that miss, that replaces P2, because that's the one that's going to be accessed furthest into the future. Now this is the cache state. And then you get another miss over here. Uh, because it's not, a, it's not a hit in the cache, and you cannot service this in parallel again. These, these are serial with each other. And this is what the cache state looks like over here. Yes? That's a big thing. That's the previous S. Oh, that's right. Yes, yes. OK, yeah. So Veldi's optimal is smarter than I am. So it should really erect the previous S, right? Because that's really the one that's going to be referenced furthest into the future. Yes, I gave you the wrong thing over here. Okay, Veldi's, Veldi's optimal replacement says, evict the block that's going to be the reference furthest into the future. And the furthest one at this point is really S1. Because this is time. This is how the loop behaves. Okay? So at the end of this loop, this is what the state, this is the state you would get uh, in the cache. That's the first iteration. But let's take a look at, let's complete the steady state. Uh, so at the beginning of the loop, at the steady state, that this is what you would get. P4, P3, P2 in the cache, S3 in the cache. And you have cache misses to P4, P3. Well, you have access to P4, P3, P2, P1. These three will hit in the cache, right? P4, P3, P2. But P1 will miss in the cache because this, the block is not in the cache. So you get three hits and one miss. Make sense? OK. So if you look at the processor stall in this case, and this is not the best uh, figure, but the takeaway is, and this is not the most aligned figure also, actually. <laughs> I should fix this somehow. But uh, you get a miss. You, the processor stalls for this miss. And then the processor doesn't stall for these. The processor stalls for this miss. The processor stalls for this miss. And the processor stalls for this miss. So you get four misses and four stalls. Assume that the misses are equal length for this case. Let's take a look at what would have happened if you cached, uh, if you were uh, parallelism aware. If 
things are accessed in parallel, they're less costly. So keep in cache those blocks that are accessed in isolation. Those isolated, try to eliminate those isolatednesses. And in this case, the isolatednesses are really S1, S2, and S3. In this case, you can potentially build a predictor that can predict this, right? Because this is a loop, this is a pattern. Okay. Oh, what happened here? Oh. This thing died. Okay, let's, let's give it a little bit more life. Okay, so what happened here, basically, at this point, we would like to have S1, S2, S3, and cache because they're the only serial misses, right? And we would get hits for all of these, right? This is the state of the cache at this point. Make sense? So we always want to keep S1, S2, S3 in the cache. Let's go back to this point. If that's the case, and we have P4 in the cache over here, what we would have is we have three misses to P3, <coughs> P2, P1, and P4 will be a hit over here. Similarly, over here, at the, at the end of this, access is P4, P3, P2, P1. We'll keep P1 in the cache because that's the last one accessed. And also S1, S2, S3 in the cache. And then the next set of accesses is P1, P2, P3, P4. So you'll get, again, three misses to P2, P3, P4, and one hit to P1. And we would like to keep S1, S2, S3 in the cache. So you'll have one hit, three misses. But if you look at this, this has better performance because you kept the isolated misses in the cache. These all are cache hits now instead of cache misses. Even though you have more cache misses in total, you do not have as many stalls. Basically, you have three cache misses here, one cache hit, but you stall <coughs> approximately for only once because these cache misses happen at the same time and their latencies are overlapped. <coughs> Similarly, for these accesses, you have three cache misses, one hit, but you stall approximately only once. So this example shows that you can do better than the optimal replacement because optimal replacement really optimizes for the cache miss rate. Right? It, does, it does minimize the cache miss rate. The number of misses is four, but it doesn't minimize the processor stall time. Make sense? So it's really important to take into account the latency when you're designing a cache in addition to the number of misses. And the key question is how do you balance them? So you actually save some cycles, as you see over here. So I'm not going to tell you how you actually design this, but this is your required reading for this week. Uh, this is a paper that we'd written, a case for MLP aware cache replacement. And the, one of the ideas was basically to take this into account. Uh, and the paper describes a policy that, that the paper first shows that it's actually predictable, uh, so whether, whether they're misses serial or isolated. And it designs a policy that takes advantage of this fact. It also introduces the idea of hybrid replacement. Basically, how do, how do you have multiple policies uh, that work together? So it should be fun, hopefully. OK. Any questions? Or you can think about designing your own policy before you read the paper. So right, Chada, you can put that reading. I, actually, it's already on the, on the website, but maybe it's not required. OK. So, so far, I've, I've assumed that, so implicitly, I've assumed that, and you uh, recognize that, I have assumed that you can have multiple cache misses that can be out, uh, outstanding at the same time. How do you support this in a cache? Let me briefly talk about that. Basically, this is the notion of non-blocking or lockup free caches. Basically, a cache that can service different, miss, uh, different requests while a miss is pending. If the processor can generate multiple cache access, can the later access be handled while the previous miss is outstanding? And if the answer is yes, then you have a non-blocking or lockup free cache. And most modern, actually all modern microprocessors have lockup free caches because it's really important to overlap the latencies of these cache misses. Uh, and the idea is pretty simple, actually. Keep track of the status and the data of the misses that are being handled in a special hardware structure called the miss status handling registers. Different manufacturers call this the different thing. Miss buffers uh, is a common one. And a cache access checks these MSHRs to see what's called an MSHR, or miss buffers, to see if a miss to the same block is already pending. If pending, a new request is not generated. So let's say you have a load that's accessing, this is a different uh, case, but if you, let's say you have a load that's accessing cache block A, uh, but uh, word 32 in the cache block, or block byte 32, and this generated a cache miss, you record this in a separate data structure close to the cache in hardware called the MSHR, and a later access, when it misses in the cache, it checks the cache first, and then you access the MSHR, 
let's say this load is accessing address A, block A, but the 16th byte, it first accesses the cache, it's a miss, and then it checks this miss status handling register to see if there's already a pending miss for that uh, cache block. And it finds that there is already a cache pending miss because this load, when it generated that miss, it recorded address A over here, block address A, saying that uh, the cache is already handling this miss. So this uh, next miss does not need to be generated. Basically, both of these loads are marked as waiting for this block that's being serviced by the cache. Make sense? It's a pretty simple data structure. And if, uh, so this has other benefits also. Basically, don't generate a request if it's already generated. It saves bandwidth. And the second is, if uh, there is already a request generated to A, and the needed data is already available, because part of the cache line is already transferred, right? Uh, then the data is forwarded to the load. So for example, uh, if these were distant enough from each other, such that uh, this block, uh, this has 64 bytes, right? Uh, and this requested all of those 64 bytes to be filled into the cache, and this is accessing zero byte. And because the transfer from this level to this level can occur uh, at a smaller granularity, let's say eight bytes, right? You may have the zeroth byte available by the time you actually execute this load. It may be sitting in the miss status handling register. You can store data over here. It may not be in, uh, written into the cache because the full cache time may not be back from the next level yet, or may not be fetched from the next level yet. But you have maybe 15 bytes of the cache line. If you do have that, and if you're accessing zeroth byte, you can forward the data from the miss status handling register to the load, and the load can go ahead without stalling. Make sense? That's an additional data structure to keep track of the status and the data of the misses. Obviously, this requires buffering of these outstanding miss requests. That's why this is called a miss buffer. OK. I think I'm going to skip this, because I already told you about this. Basically, this enables cache access when there's a pending miss. Uh, so what do you need to uh, keep track of in this case? You, you need to keep track of the outstanding cache misses. And you need to also keep track of pending load store accesses that refer to the missing cache block. Right. To be able to wake up those load stores that are waiting for that cache block once the data arrives. So you can think of this as kind of like a reservation station for misses, load misses. And once uh, the data array arrives, you need to actually wake up the load such that the load executes and broadcast its tag such that it can wake up the dependent instructions. Remember the auto order execution? This is the interface of auto order execution with main memory or memory in general. So there are a bunch of fields that you can have in an MSHR entry. Let's briefly go over that. Uh, and then I think we'll part. Yeah. I don't think we'll be able to finish caches today. But what I'll talk about next is very relevant to any kind of memory anyway. So that would be a good start for main memory. But what kind of fields do you need to have in this miss, miss buffer? Basically, obviously, a valid bit. You need to have the cache block address. Uh, this way, you can figure out whether an incoming address that uh, an next, uh, another load has generated actually matches that. You need to have some control status bits. Well, depending on whether or not you have a, a sub block, whether uh, each sub block has arrived, you can have status bits for that. You need to have data for each sub block. And you need to, uh, for each pending load and store, you need to have uh, the size of it, which byte and block it's requesting, uh, what is its destination register, or what's its tag, what's its reservation station entry, right? Because you need to wake up that load uh, from the reservation station, or store buffer entry address. So this is one example of what the misstatus handling register looks like. You have, this is one register, and these are all the load and store instructions that are actually waiting for this, miss that, uh, for this miss, because they're all to the same block. And issued means this is basically uh, done by the cache control logic. The cache control logic maybe may have queued it, but may not have issued it to the next level yet, right? OK? So this is pretty simple. And I think I already uh, told you some of this. Basically, on a cache miss, you search the miss status handling registers, of which there are many. In modern processors, there are about uh, from uh, anywhere between 8 to 32. Uh, I believe in Pentium 4, there were eight misstatus handling registers at the L1 level, and there were more at the L2 level. You search the MSHRs for a pending access to the same block. If you find it, then you allocate a low store entry in the same MSHR entry. If you haven't found it, you allocate a new MSHR. 
If there's no free entry, then you stop. This means that you have more perils and more misses than you can actually, your cache can actually keep track of. When a sub block returns from the next level in memory, you check which load and stores are waiting for it and forward the data to the load store unit, wake up the, uh, wake up the load and store, and you deallocate the load store entry in the MSHR entry. And depending on how you handle cache writes, you can write to the sub block, write the sub block in the cache or into the MSHR. Uh, and if it's the last sub block, you deallocate the MSHR after writing the block into the cache, depending on how you handle the cache writes. Okay. So hopefully this gives you an idea uh, of the design of a non-blocking cache. It's a pretty simple idea. One question is, when do you access the MSHRs? Do you actually access them in parallel with the cache or after the cache access is complete? What do you think? These are all design choices that you may make. No? After. Why after? <laughs> because that's the only time it actually becomes a, a load or a memory request. That's right, yes. You really don't need to access this uh, in parallel with the cache, right? Because you're really keeping track of the cache misses. If you're accessing them in parallel with the cache, then you, you may be putting it on the critical path of hit requests. Right? If you hit in the cache, you don't want to figure out whether it hits in the MSHR, because MSHR is just for cache misses. So you don't want to lengthen the cache hit path just to search whether or not a block is in the miss buffer in case it misses in the cache. That's the reason. And also, there's another reason, which is uh, cache hit is the most common case. Cache miss, MSHR hit is much less common. If you think about the L1 cache, for example, you have 90% hit rate in the cache. And uh, only 10% of those cases are cache misses. O only 10% of the cache access are cache misses. And maybe some of them are cache hits. So it's not a very common case. You don't want to be searching your MSHRs a lot. OK. Any questions? So maybe I'll stop here. Then. Uh, and then we'll talk about enabling high bandwidth caches. Because when you, when you actually want to do multiple accesses, you may want to do multiple accesses in parallel quickly. You, want, you may want to get uh, higher bandwidth from your memory. And we'll start with that in the next lecture, and then we'll go into main memory. Okay.